Good morning, church. As we continue to worship, would you take your copy of God's Word, turn with me to the book of Acts. We're going to be in the book of Genesis. We'll be in Matthew's Gospel. We'll be in John's Gospel. A rather unique sermon as we're going to survey a variety of biblical passages as we are reminding ourselves of what it means to be found faithful as God's people. If you walk into our sanctuary, your eyes are going to be drawn to a center object in our worship center, our sanctuary here this morning, which is the baptistry and the cross that adorns the baptistry above the baptistry. You will see our vision to be found faithful as God's people. It begs the question and is an important question for every generation to ask and to answer, what does faithfulness look like? Last week, we introduced the first of five messages in what we're calling our theological vision to be found faithful as God's people. Well, God's word is our authority. Prayer this morning is our priority. We want to be reminded of how we connect to the very presence and power of God through the gift of communication with him, talking with him, listening to him, praying to him. The house that I bought comes, it came installed with a sprinkler system. I'm really excited about that. Lived there for a few months and came back to it and uh, as the spring was here, set all the timers, pressed on, walked outside to see sort of the efficiency of all these sprinkler heads going up around uh, the yard, but to no avail. And I tinkered with it, called the previous owner. He said, ah, you know, I, I couldn't get it to work either. And so, <laughs> uh-oh, well, missed that in the home inspection, but... Uh, so I called a friend who came over and he kind of finagled it a bit and looked around. He said, well, okay, I see, I see what's going on here. You've got water here and you've got power in the house, but there's this connected wire from the timer to the actual system that's disconnected. And that's what you need to fix. Now, it's interesting because I think in many ways it's sort of a parable. Because at times, we, we can, can disconnect from the power source for our lives individually and for our church as a community. And, and it's not, if you, if you are a follower of Jesus, it's not that you have a water supply problem. If you, if you are a follower of Christ here this morning, you need to be reminded that Jesus grants you access to a well that uh, is never ending. And if you're a follower of Christ this morning, you, you don't have a power problem because granted, you, you need to be reminded the spirit of God inside of you is an inexhaustible supply of spiritual power for your life, for our church as a, as a community of believers. But at times we can have a connection problem. So that the spiritual refreshment of the living waters of Christ that, that he offers to each and every one of us, it doesn't flood our homes, it doesn't flood our hearts because we have disconnected from the power. Pr prayer is the wire. It is the wire that connects our lives individually and us as a community of believers to the very power of God. This is why prayer must be a priority for us as a church because John 15, 5, apart from him, we can do nothing. So what does it mean to be found faithful as God's people? God's word is our authority. Prayer is our priority. I want you to see this morning the priority of a praying church. You need to know that there is something that is fundamental about prayer. There is something that is instinctual about prayer in a human's life. First four chapters of the book of Genesis, you're going to come to this place where the people of God, the people that are created by him, they desire to commune with him. And in this really interesting passage in John, or Genesis chapter 4, verse 26, we read, at that time, people begin to call upon the name of the Lord. That the creation begins to desire to commune with the creator. That there is a universality to prayer that transcends all religions. That, that prayer is not unique just to the Christian faith. That a part of religious expression that transcends our world is a deep, innate desire to commune with the Creator. And it transcends denominations. It transcends religious affiliations. A recent uh, Gallup polling 
of American citizens said that nine out of ten at least profess via this poll that they pray. That 75%, three-fourths of those that were polled pray regularly. Curiously, 30% of self-professed atheists admit to pray. Now, why would that be? Why, why is there something that is so universal around prayer? Why, why is prayer often an invitation to spiritual conversations with people? You might find this, but one, one, one oftentimes level playing field to talk to people about uh, the things of God is, is to say something like, how, how can I pray for you? And of course, there's going to be a time where where someone might be offended by that. But so often, I've at least found in my own personal experiences that people welcome. They welcome prayer for them. They welcome a conversation about prayer. And it's not surprising because if you live long enough, you're eventually going to get to that place where you run into your own limitations. That your actions or the actions of other people will get you to this place where you will realize I am not enough. That that you have a limit to your intellect, you have a limit to your strength. And so it's in this moment that you have to cry out to someone who is stronger than you and smarter than you for the, the corner that you have been backed into in life. And there is an instinctual cry an instinctual desire to to commune with the Creator through prayer that so many people experience. And they often experience it in difficulties. When you think of the the man or the woman who garners the courage to attend their first AA meeting, and they walk into that room, they've come to this place where they realize that their struggle with addiction is something that they are powerless over. And it's in this moment that they, they, they admit that their only hope is a power, God himself, that is greater than themselves. Think about the soldier who, who's hunkered down in a, in a bunker and here's, here's the shelling in a, uh, off in the distance. And in this moment realizes that they are, they are a finite people. And the fear of that moment and that, and that place of, of danger that just instinctually cries out, God, if you get me out of here. And some of you know what it's like, a little closer to home, to be caring for infants. You know what it is to have a colicky baby and you're up at 3.30 in the morning on Tuesday and then on Wednesday and Thursday and you're at your wit's end and there is something deeply instinctual to say help and and that cry that cry I would say is the deepest cry of the human heart that that prayer it, it is like the oxygen that we breathe it is the water that we drink it, it is essential for you to thrive as an individual, for your family to thrive, for your workplace, for our church to thrive. Apart from him, you can do nothing. We can do nothing. Prayer is essential to our connection and communion with God. And so it, it should not be a surprise that when you open up the book of Acts and you're seeing these early snapshots of what the people of God did in that incubational state of the early church, that you have these snapshots of the people of God at prayer. In Acts chapter 1, specifically verse 14, you have the 120 that are gathered in the upper room. We have Jesus post his resurrection, pre his ascension, and they're gathered in the upper room. And what are they going to commit themselves to do? Well, notice in verse 14, Acts 1, all these with one accord were devoting themselves to strategic planning. Verse 14, all these with one accord were devoting themselves to intentional demographic studies to be able to see what the felt needs of the people were in that moment so that they could have a good marketing message to be able to take the message of Jesus' resurrection to that Greco-Roman world. No! All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer. Just go down to verse 24. One of the first decisions that the early apostles, they have to decide is, is uh, 12 is the magic number, and they, because of Judas, are at 11. And they've got to get back to 12. 
And how will they choose Judas' replacement? Well, again, in verse 21, we read that they're going to cast lots. And what did the people of God do? They pray for the wisdom to be able to select Judas' replacement. Go over to the next chapter. In chapter 2, verse 42, you have a Polaroid picture of, of what it meant for the church to worship together. What were they doing when they worshiped together daily and, and weekly? Verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. I mean, you see where this is going here. I mean, and I could go on throughout uh, the, the uh, Acts chapter 4. I could go to Acts chapter 13 where you have the prophets and the teachers. They're praying and they're fasting. And it's in that spirit that they select uh, Paul and Barnabas to go on the first missionary journey. So all throughout the book of Acts, one way that we see the Acts of the Apostles is that the Acts of the Apostles on bended knee praying to God for his wisdom and his guidance. Now, of course, they prayed privately. But there is something not just about the individual apostles in their own secret rooms praying, but rather it's them gathered together. And where did they get that instinct from? Well, they got it from Jesus himself. Think of the question that those disciples asked Jesus and he answered in the Sermon on the Mount. They asked, Lord, teach us how to pray. And these are Jewish people. Faithful, they, 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 they knew the Shema, but they, they noted that something about this rabbi would give them an instinct to pray in a way that was different than how they had prayed before. And so Jesus answers them. You see it on the screen. We know it as the Lord's Prayer, the model's prayer. Matthew 6, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We, the choir just beautifully sung that over us as a prayer to us. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we've also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Notice much that is there to take note of, but I want you to see the pronouns. You say, David, what do you mean the pronouns? Well, Jesus could have given us the model prayer with you and me and I all throughout it, but he doesn't. He gives us the model prayer with us and our and we. It is a communal prayer. So one of the distinctives of the people of God is that we are a people, yes, that pray privately, yes, that pray individually, but there is something about the gathered people of God submitting to his will, his way, as we corporately, shoulder to shoulder, say, apart from you, we can do nothing. And this is true for families. This is true for friends. This is true for bodies of believers, whether it's there in Jerusalem in those early days of the church or whether it's here in Birmingham, Alabama, that apart from him, we can do nothing. And that's not just true biblically, but it is true in church history. You get through the conclusion of the first century into the second century. And what were those early Christians doing? But one thing that they were doing, according to Tertullian, early church father, was this. We gather in an assembly, and as if we had formed a military unit, we force our way up to God by prayer. This power is pleasing to God. You know what he's saying? That's the wire. That's the connective tissue. We, we want to commune with God. We want to receive his direction. And, and prayer is the, is the sanctified, given way that God has for us to commune with him. And you fast forward, and there's so many examples of this, but I just want you to see a taste that when the people of God bend their knee in prayer, that God moves in miraculous ways. And there's so many examples of this. I'll just give you one example. Many of you remember from high school history or you remember from a college American history class, what we knew as the first great awakening. But then in the 19th century, you have the second great awakening. So go back to 1857. Go back to names like Jeremiah Lamphere on September the 23rd. He's a lay person. He's not a seminary president. He's not a pastor, but he has a need. He has this hunger and this desire to see the people of God praying together. Together. And so he tacks up these invitations, these little flyers, all throughout New York City. 12 o'clock, September the 23rd, 1857, he rents the space and he calls people at Fulton Street to gather together in prayer. 12 o'clock comes, opens the doors, nobody comes. Not a single person shows up. 
he prays. He's alone at 1215. He's alone at 1220. Some passerbyers see him praying. By the end of the prayer meeting, there's six people, including himself. He's dejected. The next week, he prays, same time, same place, 20 people. October 1857, there was a stock market crash. Unemployment goes through the roof. There was a place of tremendous fear and uncertainty. In just a few months, that prayer meeting that started with zero, that went to six, that went to 20, historians tell us that at times in New York City, there were 10 to 50,000 men at high noon every day praying. And it wasn't just New York City, but it spread across our country. You go back to 1858, the Second Great Awakening, in one year, one million people in our country come to faith in Jesus Christ. To put that into perspective, the whole population was 30 million. So one out of 30 people in a year span come to faith in Christ. And we see that it starts with the seed, like a mustard seed of one person tacking up these invitations to say, we need to bow our knee in prayer. And six people show up and then 20 people show up. And there is like a forest fire that catches and the Spirit of God moves in miraculous ways. And we see that fed through this wire of dependency upon God in prayer. So prayer, my friends, it is the oxygen that we breathe. It is essential for vitality and life and the movement of God in our midst, in our families, in our communities, in our church, the priority of a praying church. But I want you also to see this morning, not just the priority, but I want you to see the characteristics of a praying church. And there there, there are many that we could talk about here, but I just want to give you two words to leave you with that are not only true for our church, but they're true for your life. If you and I, if we are going to be a praying church, there must be a spirit of dependency. One of the unique challenges of the Christian church right now is the affluence that we all swim in. There are always challenges. Every every generation faces challenges. But we live in a day and age where I don't know if there's ever been a time where we more subtly are tempted to think that the growth of the church, the health of the church, the vitality of the church, the vitality and health of our own lives is dependent more on us and our resources and our ability. And we think oftentimes that if we have good enough plans And if we have the right gifted people, and if we have a theology that is orthodox enough, and if we work really hard, then, then, hey, everything is good. And what can end up happening is, is rather than trusting in the power of God, we end up trusting in us. And our doings and our strivings. And it's subtle because good planning, you know, church, it really does matter. And God called men and women, they really do matter. And wonderful life group leaders that are opening up God's word and leading, they really do matter. All of this matters. But prayer is always a safeguard that reminds us that the flourishing of Christ's church doesn't first and foremost depend upon our strivings, but first and foremost depends upon the Spirit of God blowing in our midst here. And so prayer is us humbly extending what Thomas Manton once said, this is the empty hand, I love this definition, the empty hand of the soul, which looks for all from God. This is a spirit of dependency. Are are you desperately dependent upon him to move in your life? Are we as the people of God desperately dependent upon him to move in our church? I remember when our boys were much younger, years ago. It doesn't feel like that long ago, but they're big and they're way past this period right now. But years ago, one of the first phrases that I remember my children learning to say was always in the context with all three of them, it was the, the routine of putting them in their car seat and me or their mom buckling them in. 
when they started to get, you know, a little bit older and they could formulate a few words, one of the first words that they put together were these words, no, <laughs> let me do it. No, dad, let me do it. No, mom, let me do it. And they, they weren't older. They didn't have the dexterity enough in their hands to be able to do it. And certainly not in the times, you know, you had to put the buckles right there between their legs. You had to put it together right there. But they wanted to do it. And, and when we are prayerless and we are inconsistent in our prayer life, you know, there, there's no other way to say it than we are saying to God, no, God, let me do it. I'm strong enough to do it. I'm smart enough to do it. I'm old enough to do it. And our prayerlessness, it reveals always a sign of pride and arrogance. I, I want to soften that. I want to say that in a different way. I want to say it for my own life. I want to say, well, no, 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 it's not a sign of pride and arrogance. Rather, it's just forgetfulness. We're just out of the habit. We're just so busy. See it for what it is. When we are a prayerless people, it is always a revelation that we are saying to God, no, I can do it myself. So what does it mean to be a praying church? It means that we have a spirit of dependency. Apart from him, we can do not a few things, not some things, but church, nothing. Spirit of dependency, but also an attitude of consistency this seems to be sort of perfunctory to say, but a praying church prays. And you say, well, David, uh, well, of course, of course a praying church prays. But I have to say that because one of the unique challenges that can occur is that in a church we talk about prayer and we teach about prayer and we read about prayer and we even have prayer retreats. But sometimes... Our talking about prayer can replace our actual praying. Sometimes our thinking about prayer can actually replace our praying. I remember vividly leading a prayer meeting decades, well, not decades ago, about 15 years ago, one of the first churches I pastored, Miss Anita came up to me and she said, Pastor, in this prayer meeting on a Wednesday night at 6 o'clock, we talked about all these people in the prayer guide and all their different ailments and how we needed to pray for them. And then we talked about all the different missionaries and their birthdays and where they were serving and how we needed to pray for them. And then we talked about all these other things here that were on the prayer guide. And we had this wonderful conversation for about 45 minutes about how all we need to be informed about the people that we're praying for. And we pray for five minutes. And I said, I said, yes, ma'am, is what I said. <laughs> Yes, ma'am, you are right, that you are accurate. And she was right. And that can happen. That can happen because Satan is so cunning. He, he wants to disconnect the wire even when we think we're in communion with him. And so we can end up in our life groups or we can end up in our family talking about prayer thinking about prayer, reading about prayer, but a praying church, a praying people actually pray. And this is a praying church. One of the deepest joys I have as your pastor is to have a 35,000 foot view of what most people, if not any person other than myself and some other staff members are able to see. I'm able to see the people of God in consistency and dependency upon God in prayer. And there are these wonderful, I, I just stand before you to report these wonderful movements of God around prayer here at our church. I think about our students, nine-year-olds and 10-year-olds, 11-year-olds, children, who, who have walked into your life groups. And a part of a wonderful emphasis in the life of this church is to not just teach them to pray, by them reading about prayer or hearing how to pray, but for them to walk into life groups and to hold the hand of people that are the age of their parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents, and to pray over them. And for those recipients to walk into the sanctuary with these stickers that they had been prayed for, and hasn't it stirred your heart? A childlike faith and the childlike prayers 
praying to a big God with a huge expectancy of how he is going to move, that that is not a part of a national movement called kidspraying.org that we signed up for. It, It is just the people of God in a spontaneous grassroots movement saying, we want our children to have the baton of prayer passed to them. And what better way for them to learn to pray than to do it, to talk to God. I stand before you as one who gets to see and hear of weekly gatherings, birthed out of life groups, small groups, sometimes at people's homes, sometimes in nooks and and, uh, hideaway sort of spots at the church, various times throughout the week, sometimes at restaurants, around coffee, just people praying together, praying for the church, praying for their families, praying for our communities praying for the gospel to advance in our nation, the gospel to advance through missionaries across this world. Not a program, but again, just this grassroots movement of the people of God saying we're going to gather together to pray. One night a month, I get to sit with deacons, 48 men who love this church, servant leaders, by far, five years, the highlight of that meeting is the end of that meeting, where these men split up into groups and just beseech the Lord. God, we need your wisdom to be found faithful as God's people. The opportunities that are before us, the needs within the body of Christ, apart from you, we can do nothing. And it's this wonderful solidarity of the deacon body to be able to say together, we are going to be a people that pray together. Every Sunday morning, right below the sanctuary, 8 o'clock, you can walk in, open invitation to any person, any person. Just round tables, people of God, just praying. You know what they're praying for? They're praying for our life groups. They're praying for the mission trips of this church. They're praying for over 200 students that right now are coming back from a back-to-school retreat. You know what they're praying for? They're praying for hearts to be convicted through the, through the gathered worship of singing, through the preaching of God's word. They're praying for those that are really comfortable to be afflicted and convicted. And they're praying for the afflicted to be comforted by the spirit of God. You know what they're doing? They're, they're joining together saying, apart from you, we can do nothing. Now listen, we can be a prayerless people that go through the motions. You can do this in your own life. You, you can do this. As a church, and activities can go by, and we can quote unquote get by, but getting by is not enough. Getting by is not what it means to be found faithful as God's people. And the needs are so great. We live in a land that is so divided. We live in a land where there is spiritual opportunity. There is darkness and there's lostness. And to penetrate that darkness, we need the Spirit of God to move in this church and beyond this church. And we as the people of God must bend our knee in solidarity together to say, apart from you, we can do nothing. And we don't seek to just get by. We don't just seek to survive. We don't just seek to exist. We want to be moved by you and your will and your way. That God is what we want in our homes. That's what we want in our lives. That's what we want in the deepest parts of our hearts. And even when we don't want it, it's in that moment that we're crying out to him. God, we don't want that. But we confess our lack of a desire for you. And we come to him in confession and he meets us just as we are. You don't have to dress up your prayers. You don't have to be a 17th century Shakespeare wannabe with all the right words. The words don't matter as much as the posture of your heart. And as a pastor... One thing I have to remind myself and remind us as a church is the most powerful thing that we can often do seems to be so simple that we can often overlook it. It is easy for us to discount the importance of a solitary individual before work, setting their alarm, going out on their patio or in that special chair, and bowing their head and talking to God. It is easy for us to discount the power of the people of God gathering in a life group, 
bowing their heads and talking to God. It is easy for us to discount the power of a, of a family at the end of a long day and the kids are going in a million different directions and you gather them together. And even if it's just for a few moments, you hold hands and you bow your head and it's in that moment that we're connected to something that is far beyond us. We're connected to the very presence of God and the power of God. Her vision is to be found faithful as God's people. That's why prayer is our priority. Because apart from him, church, we can do nothing. 